right, you ready to go? All right, two learning objectives for tonight. First one, what the heck happened in 2008? And second, how, how is synectics used in the classroom? Now, to start you off, we'll start you off with a problem. Taking that internship in a remote mountain lab might not have been the best idea. Pulling that lever with the skull symbol just to see what it did probably wasn't so smart either. But now is not the time for regrets, because you need to get away from these mutant zombies fast. With you are the janitor, the lab assistant, and the old professor. You've gotten a head start, but there's only one way to save you across an old growth bridge spanning a massive gorge. And you can dash across while the lab assistant takes two minutes. The janitor is a bit slower and needs five minutes. And the professor takes a whole ten minutes, holding onto the ropes every step of the way. By the professor's calculations, the zombies will catch up to you in just over 17 minutes. So you only have that much time to get everyone across and cut the ropes. Unfortunately, the bridge can only hold two people at a time. To make matters worse, it's so dark out that you can barely see, and the old lantern you grabbed on your way only illuminates a tiny area. Can you figure out a way to have everyone escape in time? Remember, no more than two people can cross the bridge together. Anyone crossing must either hold the lantern or stay right next to it, and any of you can safely wait in the dark on either side of the gorge. Most importantly, everyone must be safely across before the zombies arrive. Otherwise, the first zombie could step on the bridge while people are still on it. Finally, there are no tricks to use here. You can't swing across, <laughs> use the bridge as a raft, or befriend the zombies. So no creativity? No. <laughs> well, actually, there is creativity, but it's not in the way that you think. So, we're going to keep that idea in mind. You can think about it for a while. We will, we'll come back to work on that question here in a minute. But, for the next few, uh, this little page that I gave you is stage one of synectics. All right? It's just a way to, uh, a new way that they have for students to take uh, notes on. The way it works is everything here on your left side, this is what you hear from me, okay? Any new bit of information that you find, you're gonna write it down. After we go through each slide, I'll take it a minute, and then you're supposed to go through on the right side and write your ideas, your feelings, what you think about that piece of information next to it. Try to personalize the piece of information that you wrote down, all right? Every one of the uh, handouts is attached. All right. So, synectics, it's really just a, a new combination of uh, ways to do things. I mean, we've pretty much seen the parts and pieces of synectics. It's just been described in different ways, like brainstorming or lateral thinking. Uh, in synectics, they just take it and they use it in a different way and in a more processed way to get students to kind of think outside the box. Um, part of it is through um, climate thinking and action, okay? You have to have a climate where the students feel that it's okay to go through and just throw out some really weird stuff. You have to have the students thinking outside the box, otherwise they're just repeating what everybody else is saying. And then their actions, they have to have some sort of buy-in with it. They need to be able to go through and throw some of the wildest things out there. And it's not that it's a bad idea. It's more about this idea may not work because. And then they go through and start talking. And it's supposed to start talking about how their ideas may not work and how they could fix it or recreate it to make it to work. Now, um, brainstorming, lateral thinking, and synectics are all part of the information processing family. 
but they also call it creative problem solving skills and pretty much all together. Uh, now, to get to the creativity, they want students not to just regurge what the, um, they might be thinking, because like with the uh, zombie thing, what, what, what do you think most responses for the students would be to solve that? Leave them behind. Yeah, leave them behind. Just throw them. <laughs> exactly. Spend for yourself. <laughs> Janitor, professor, we'll see you later. One minute, two minutes, we'll be across and we'll be 15 minutes ahead. But the thing is, is how many teachers that you know would stop them and go, well, how would you feel if you were that janitor or that professor? Well, I mean, furthermore, like, if, if everyone decides that they're just all going to go for it, then they're all going to die because the bridge will only hold two. So it's in their best interest to work together unless the professor agrees that they're going to just stay and leave them by. You know, <laughs> yeah. professor, go back, sacrifice yourself. You can give us another yeah. three minutes, right? Yeah, that kind of thing. But a, a lot of students, well, and I do bring in the zombie thing because I found with my students, zombies, and like that's the thing right now. You bring in zombies to the classroom, and, and they're all in, they're engaged, they're ready to go. Walking dead, walking dead. So, these are the two individuals that came up with synaptics. And depending on who you talk to, either Prince was the founder or Gordon was the founder. Now, if you get back into the actual research of it, uh, William Gordon is the one that came up with it first. He started working on synaptics back in 1943, and he was doing his thesis at Harvard, and he was going over synaptics at the time. At the time, he didn't call it synaptics, so he would just call it creative thinking. Now, as soon as he was done with his thesis in uh, 44, he then moved into creating a, uh, basically a, a company, a research development company uh, that was with, I want to make sure I get this right, it was S-E-S, Synectics Educational Skills. And he started that company, and then after uh, Gordon started the company, he then hired in George Prince, who came in uh, initially to work with the research company. Uh, Gordon had him work with his two daughters that had just dropped out of uh, private school on developing uh, Synectic modules and on the American Revolution. And essentially, George Prince at the time had just graduated with his bachelor's degree in something. And I swear <laughs> I went through every research avenue I could find. I know he graduated from Harvard, and he had a bachelor's. And that's the, all it said. That's more than enough. Yeah. So uh, anyway, he, he proceeded to work with uh, Gordon for the next, uh, up until the 1961. And sometime during that time between uh, uh, the uh, 1950s and 1961, uh, George Prince moved up to be a part of the regular monthly, they had a synectics training group that they did on a monthly basis. Now understand, most of this up until this point, it's mostly they were working on it for businesses. Uh, synectics actually started out as a type of way to uh, develop a business meeting so you could get people doing research and development in those uh, planning meetings. Now, sometime around 1950s to 1961, William Gordon met Jerome Bruner. Y'all know who, who he is? Sure. Everybody aware? Yeah, he, did, he did concept retaining. Uh-huh, self-efficacy. Uh, Jerome Bruner was the one that encouraged uh, Gordon to go through and start writing a book on synectics, and that it might be actually developed for education. Now, after that, oh, and by the way, um, from 1949 on, uh, William Gordon also went through and started recording all, the, all of his uh, synectic sessions so that he could go back and review them and start writing research and stuff on them. So this is up and through 61. Uh, 
It was 1958 that George Prince was hired, and from 58 to 61, he was doing his thing. They started out with the Author D. Little Company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and that's who the original Synectics group was with. And then in the mid-60s, like 62, 63, up to 65, they moved out and they became Synectics Educational Systems and they started focusing on creating uh, creativity materials for schools. So, up until then, it was uh, from 61 through 76 that Gordon actually paired up with another uh, researcher named Tony Pose, P-O-Z-E, um, and they got together and actually continued writing research articles on synectics and by, I believe it was uh, 1974, they had somewhere around 40, a combination of articles, books, and other materials, about 40 different uh, uh, articles. So, after moving from 76 to 81, you started the hiring of these two people. Uh, Vincent Nolan and Connie Williams are, uh, well, Connie Williams is the one that's currently running the company. Uh, Vincent Nolan was helping her up until 2014. And if y'all didn't notice, I gave the dates that they passed away in this. So if you'll notice, that 2008 mark, that's whenever George Prince was, uh, or 2009 is wherever he passed away. Now, the problem that happened here is they tried since about 61 to about 2010 trying to get synectics to jump with the education market. Um, they actually uh, created an education division that was eventually headed by Vincent Noland. Uh, Vincent Noland tried several times to get it to uh, go and be picked up but for some reason, nobody in education really picked it up from them. He even hired in a, a another researcher, uh, Ms. Vass, V-A-S, to go through and do the research on it because she was had a psychology degree at the time. And pretty much they had at least 20 or 30 articles in-house that they had done with uh, Synectics where they went through and did quasi-experimental. And they came up with uh, all that material, yet still no one in education really picked up and ran with it. And yeah, no. Uh, personally, my opinion, like I said, whenever I was going through researching this stuff, I'm expecting some letters after some names, PhDs, EDDs, and stuff like that. All of these people, out of all of them, the only one with any sort of advanced degree, it looks like, is Connie Williams, and she has an MBA. So. That may have been some of their, what they were butting up against. Um, also, considering that you, uh, during this time period, uh, somewhere around 2008, 2007, they switched out the name from Synectics Educational Systems to just Synectic World. And they've got the entire website there. And as soon as they moved in to where uh, uh, Mr. Noah and Ms. Williams were, uh, running the company. They actually started about 2007-2008, uh, a few years after uh, uh, Mr. Gordon died. They started pushing the narrative through their company that it was actually George Prince that came up with the uh, whole process of semantics. So that may be some of the problems here. All right, so, and this is a statement directly from the company. Uh, essentially, they have said, and the company has actually put out a book, which I included in my uh, research here at the end, called Imagine That, where um, Vincent Nolan goes through and basically writes out the entire history of the company and how it was uh, integrated into business and into education and all that. And towards the end of the book, he put this in there. Despite the successful experiments and evidence by Ms. Yaz, uh, success using the techniques in the classroom, uh, the sy Synectics Education Division, which uh, Vincent Nolan was heading at the time, had no success in persuading educational authorities to fund further trials, and the Education Division had to be closed, and that was 2010. So, like I said, but anyway, that's your 
quick history lesson of what's been happening since then. Uh, I will say, if you'd like to, uh, Synectic World still has, and they used to be selling a lot of these materials, but I found out since 2010 and them shutting down that uh, education division, most of their materials are now free. You can download them directly from the company website. Now, I'm not saying that the company shut down, it's just they've changed focus from education back over to business, and that's where they're making most of their money. All right, so, out of your notes. What did you find that you was interesting? Interesting. What did y'all find that was personal to you? Did that narrative of their history sound like anything you've been dealing with? Would anybody like to share their insights? Just off of the history piece? Or Just off the history piece, first panel. I think it's just interesting how they did not take off in the educational world, but then when you name something like synectics, it's just like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that started in the business world first. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, I will say, that may be some of my personal bias whenever I went through and did the research. Because whenever I started doing my dissertation stuff, like everybody I'm going after, PhD or EDD after it, and I gotta say, whenever I started seeing, not seeing those letters after names or seeing where, hey, this person works at this university and this is their expertise thing, I'm like sitting there going, well, how do you know? And I'm questioning a lot of their stuff a lot. More. But sometimes, too, if you fit like a business model into like an mm -hmm. educational model or in, in, in the world mm -hmm. of education, sometimes it doesn't quite. Yeah, it, it just doesn't mesh all well, that well. I feel like we do, that happens often. We take theories from business and we kind of try to transform them mm -hmm. into the education setting. I mean, I know learning communities actually came from the business mm -hmm. setting as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, but I wonder what, how the process works where it doesn't really mesh. To me, I think it's a combination of as educators, we're a little bit off to the side. We're used to, you know, getting those things to fit, mm -hmm. but we don't like people coming in and telling us, "Yeah, this is the way you should be doing it," unless you have the educational background to go with it. Because I know, at least at the college level, if somebody comes into my biology classes trying to tell me how to teach biology, I'm gonna be expecting them to either, in one breath, tell me they have an education degree, or in the other breath, tell me that they have a biology degree. If you don't have that and you're stepping into my classroom doing that to me, I'm going to be like, yes. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things they were a little bit lacking. That and also, whenever you go through and it, it, in your own company story, you're talking about, like with uh, George Prince, he said he had to go and essentially try five times to interview with Gordon just to get him to hire him. And then proceeds in the book to explain, hey, they just took me and put me to the side with the kids from the uh, owner of the company, and they weren't any good. So it's like, so in my mind, I'm thinking, well, how good are you if you're being stuck with them? <laughs> so, and that's just me. All right. Anybody else would like to share? All right, because we're going to get through a, quite a bit of sharing here in just a minute. Okay, so how it works. Now, the first part is the note taking, okay? Students are generating ideas from their note taking, okay? From what you present. Um, then, there's two different ways for synectics. It's dependent on whether or not you're looking at stuff that's brand new, or you're looking at stuff from it's, you know it, but you need to think about it in a different way. With the steps to make something new from the old, it's really only six steps, all right? And first step is basically you uh, defining or describing your current problem. You go down and you write your ideas on different analogies. What they're talking about with analogies, synectics is very tightly combined with metaphors and similes. So you take two things and you put them together so that you know, you could say something like, how is a rocket like a plane? How is a rocket like a car? How is a rocket like a poodle? 
I don't, you stick things together that you wouldn't normally stick together to get the juices flowing in the creativity. Then you're going to write down your reactions to personal analogies. So how do you feel about that rocket? What do you think about the rocket? Is it scary? Is it fun? Do you think it somehow impacts on your personal life? Then you have them go through and they're going to compress their conflicts and uh, form an oxymoron. Basically, you're going to take two words, stick them together that really shouldn't be together. Like, how is an igloo like a... Uh, the example that they gave, how is an igloo like a tent? Okay, those two things don't normally go together. Or how is, how do you feel happy and sad at the same time? You know, take two opposites, stick them together, and then they have to explain how it fits. All right? And then the last thing is after you, uh, or second to last, after you go through, you write down new direct analogies, new similes from that. Typically, the teacher will go through and provide at least examples of the first direct analogies, but by the time you get down to here, you're expecting the students to come up with their own. And then the last thing is, you take and you re-examine your original problem with those analogies that the students came up with. Now, like I said, okay, how many of y'all that seems like? Overly complicated. I mean, <laughs> I can understand maybe why I didn't take off. Now. I know. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, that's only one stage. Second stage. How many stages are there? There's three stages. The notes, taking, uh, taking from new to old, and then taking from strange to familiar. Now. What they say after you read through and you research all of these steps, because if you put them together, what is it, 13 steps to get through the whole thing? They go through and they go, well, you don't have to use all of it. You can use some of it, or you can use parts of it. But then they go through also in the research and say, well, this is kind of like brainstorming, and it's kind of like lateral thinking. And I'm sitting here going through the research, and I'm going, well, then why aren't I using brainstorming and lateral thinking? So, anyway, yeah, with it, taking strange to familiar, they add a step. All right? So, let's get down to it. We're going to get down to that original zombie question. If you will flip over. Now, I've kind of done this a little more of a complicated way, but so that you'll have something to it. Uh, in their original research, they said most of these steps can actually be done verbally, and as long as you've got the students set up to where they know they to expect the stages, you could probably give the questions on the board, you could throw them into it, let them go on their own. But I don't, like I said, overly complicated, we need a little structure to go with this. So, I want y'all in your groups, or if you want to move over and do it by yourself, that's fine. First stage, what is the problem? In your groups, I'll give you about three minutes. Come up with exactly what was the problem from the zombies. The zombies were coming to get them and to ask the place to get them. In the Cross and cut it before the zombie. Oh, so the zombie can't come over. Chair, what are the other two phases? Well, I'm not quite sure because. Um, uh, <laughs> first phase was if it's the zombie. Yes, it can leave. Okay. If it's the zombie, and then the second phase from new to old, and then the third phase, strange to familiar. Okay. <laughs> So, so ten minutes for the professor, five minutes for the janitor. Okay. Somebody, janitor. you can get across the board. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, sell. Yes, so, Adam. Just reset your problem. Somebody was throwing parts and pieces. Yeah. You need to cross the Who was two minutes? Professor. Joe and Jeff. 
Who was two minutes? I, I think the assistant. Yeah. The assistant. Oh, yeah, assistant. Uh, right. Then the girl was two. The janitor Maybe was three, Jeremy? Well. The janitor was five. Well, what, David? Oh, the last of the two. Like, well, what, David? The janitor was five. Yes, they were. Boys. Uh, and then uh, the light can open. The light has to come back. <laughs> One minute. The lantern. Lantern's he gotta come back. Like oh, because they can't see, you know, walk off the bridge or something. Yeah. The the lantern. Lantern. But then nobody will ever get on the YouTube. Well, yeah. So two people go. One person comes back. Next person. Again, then I'll walk you through the next one. Okay. Yes. 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 Professor's Who apparently got it all worked out. I don't know why we're having to do this because the professor did all the calculations anyway. Why don't they just solve Jerry, who is the one? <laughs> <laughs> That's like that. That was me. Oh, it was us. It was us. I'm, yeah. I'm not noticed. I did give you all the uh, URL for the video if you need to see it again. But you watch the second half. Oh, wait, wait. Are we moving on or just doing the problem? Just doing the problem right now. Oh, okay. Before the zombies get done. Well, if you think about it, 17 minutes. 17 minutes? That you have to have it completed to cut the rope before the zombies. Yeah. Because, so but, it's got to be less than that. Because otherwise, if a zombie is on the bridge, then you fall off because that's yeah, too much weight. Too many people. Yeah. So really, why you have to cut the ropes? Because so there's the zombies. Them, so well, but then they're good, they're stupid, right? But so even if one, they're all going to get on the bridge and only two can go across, so it's yeah, going to yeah. fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. Maybe yeah, just cut it to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So 17 minutes of 10. The slow guy and the For him, the whole time. I say you just try right. to go in. Plus five, plus and then the other two just run across. Okay. Oh, I forgot about this really light. What's the problem? Two people. Uh, uh, the zombies are coming. Um, and so there's four people. you got to get them across. Four the four people, people are... There's the professor, there's the janitor, there's yourself, and there's the assistant. Um, the professor takes 10 minutes, the janitor takes 5 minutes, uh, the assistant takes 2 minutes, yourself take, you just take 1 minute. Only 2 people can go across the bridge at a time. And also the light has to come back and forth. Nope. Right? And uh, you got to have it done before, like, before, like, 17 minutes is up because else you'll have too many people on the bridge when they reach it and then they will die. Perfect. Anybody else have anything more than what our group back here has? So, you're going to All right. Okay. Now, next stage. I've given you uh, four examples there. And I want to know how those examples are like your riddle. Mm -hmm. Now, so first one is sink Oh, just a sinking ship. See right here. How is the riddle like getting your team to answer on time? How is it? And there's these four. That's why I want you to answer next. Find how they are alike. Yes, he was. Start jumping down. How are they like the Well, if you don't get off, you're going to sink the ship. Just like if you don't get off, the are going to get it. Who's going down with the ship? It's going to be running quick, so I'll reduce it to two minutes so we can make it through. Uh, how's this riddle like getting your team to answer on time? To answer what? You got good? Um, how is the riddle like taking your children to the places you need to go? Wait time. Wait time. Transportation. Okay, speed's very. They're all different. They have different. Uh, 
Did you hear the one about the three tomatoes? You know, the papa tomato, the mama tomato, and the baby tomato? The baby tomato was lagging behind. They were all running, and the baby tomato was lagging behind. The daddy tomato waited and then squashed the baby tomato and said, catch up. <laughs> so how is this riddle like getting groceries to the grocery store? I mean, it's, I think it's very similar to the joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, uh, how is this riddle like getting groceries to the grocery store? Different schedules. Yeah, and planning so you don't have to. Requirements. Different schedules, but all these. Should this be front of the I don't want, no, no. Yeah. Like yeah. Like yeah. Groceries? Yeah. Yeah. Just going, yeah. taking groceries to the grocery like store. Well, why would I take well, groceries to the grocery store? If you're, if you're if a truck. It's not you. Oh. That's the stereotype, but I know. But I like my brother was the same way. He would have to be the insurance All right, hold there once you get those. Uh, actually. Oh, step three? I'm like, I turn. We'll do step three in a second. I have all of this. Yeah. All right. No, I don't. <laughs> don't act <laughs> Okay, so step three is y'all personalizing the problems. Okay? So we're going to talk about your feelings about the problem. We're going to talk about how would you do something. We're going to talk about what do you have in common, and then how would it affect your life if this happened. I don't know what I would, I don't like, save me. Scared. Fight, fight, like, you have to fight for yourself. Like, make yourself. How would you like to do that? Yes. Very much. Kind of sell yourself that I'm worth taking. Keep it. I'm getting your children. <laughs> this is why we don't have children. That's right. See, that's the only reason I knew I could ask this question because some of us would have kids and some of us wouldn't. How would you like to live? 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 For me, this is planning and transportation. I feel like affected by getting groceries to the grocery store. It, it means, what is your preferred way to I, solve problems? I I would, from eating food. Are you going to force them into it? Or are you going to like talk them through, through it? Yeah, are you, yeah, yeah. It, it's, so most of these are getting down check. to engagement. Right. And how is the usual way that you can take care of your problems? And what you're trying to do is find out how the other people oh, in your group how they go through and design the solutions for their problems because they may have a different way of thinking about the problem than you do. Got it. And, and the one thing that um, kind of gets me with this part, I, I'm trying to figure out, because I didn't find anything in the research, how are the students supposed to know that without you explicitly telling them mm -hmm. this is why you're doing these four? Well, we're not doing this up. We're doing no, this I'm just kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding, but like to use it with you know, in your classroom, okay. to go through the uh, yeah. Work through the problem. Mm -hmm. But if not, it's just like, Yeah, maybe. Um, time constraints. Okay. Scenario. Here, here's the thing. That, um, okay. You have 17 minutes. So let's just, uh, let's, let's just try to do it this way. Let's have this genius person. Yeah, number one. Okay. Has everybody made it through step three? Not and yet. you're down to explain? Okay. Not quite. Another minute. The differences. Okay. One, two, five, ten minutes to go. So, so, one, two, three, and four is that we can follow? Yeah, we'll get to oh, this yeah. here in a minute. Yeah. If you only have to go back to the class, then you'll have to all you're doing for the next few steps is yeah. bringing yeah. all those commonalities yeah. and differences between yeah. them in one yeah. place. So yeah. One doing like yeah. do cross country, yeah. one doing band, and one doing cross. This is the movement. Yeah. So, four different things. And so, so what I propose is that we have with the 
Okay, you're gonna call me ABC. Yeah. So then let's see. Yeah, oh my gosh, yes. Like making those turns. So here's what we're gonna do. Two people need to go. Yeah. So, so B and C are gonna be left behind. And then we're gonna go across. Okay, this means yeah. they've gone across. And then over here we're gonna have A and D go. Okay. And so the amount of time left is at this point there's ten minutes okay. gone. Right. Can I have so your attention back here? All right. I see y'all doing exactly what I expected. How many of y'all are jumping directly to trying to solve? Yeah. I mean, are you doing an yeah. ethical study? Or? <laughs> no, 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 I'm just, remember, I was going through the research. I, I was looking at the steps going, okay, a lot of students are going to hit about halfway through these steps, and they're going to jump right to the end, and they're like, ah, oh, let's just solve this. Well, I personalized it. It was step three. It's personal to me. i got to get this done. <laughs> All right, so if y'all would range it back a little bit. So where y'all should be is explain the similarities between the new and the old examples, or the riddle and the examples, and then explain the differences. So what did you come up with that's the same that's with the riddle? What skills or data or what are you going to need to know to solve okay. that problem? So what do we need to know to solve the problem? Mm -hmm. And then the difference is really what you're looking at is what extra information were in those examples that you don't need to solve the riddle. Because what we're looking for is you probably already know the processes on how to solve that riddle, at least in between everybody here. We're just trying to narrow it down to what exactly do you need and don't need. So if you've done that, sorry. Um, Okay. And then we're going to jump to uh, the next page, which is going to be rewriting that, your well, question. Ten, and we'll do that here in just two minutes. That's how I see it, that the days are, the numbers are like the days. Okay, got about 30 <laughs> seconds, 30 seconds. so we will jump ahead. So next stage in this. Now, the reason why they want you to go through all of those analogies is because Yes, this is the CDC website. Now, 
analogies are very powerful when you're looking at how you react in real life and different situations like the zombie epidemic. CDC, CDC went through in about 2000, uh, 2013 and they 